Okay, so let me, I got some of my, some of my, my favorite eye candy up on the graph here. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about black holes, black holes in our galaxy, and black holes um, outside of our galaxy, and some of the biggest black holes in the universe. And what I want to stress is why we do this and, 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 and the importance that science and astronomy plays uh, uh, for us. Um, so here's, here's a couple of shots here. So in the bottom left here is the Hobby Eberly a telescope. Have, have a few of you been out to a McDonald Observatory? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it, so it's a fantastic place. And it is one of the most enjoyable things. And to echo what um, Serafina talked about is just, so being alone on top of a mountain and looking at the sky is just, I get goosebumps every time I do it. It is just a fantastic experience. It is all about nothing in that case. Um, so that's the HET. Most of the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, comes from the Hobby Eberly Telescope. That is one of the largest telescopes in the world. It's a telescope that we own at the University of Texas. Um, on the right side is the Giant Magellan Telescope. That's the one that we are building. It's about a billion a dollar telescope. It is a, a, a crazy large a telescope. It's going to do fantastic things. Okay, what I want to talk to you about um, are some of the biggest black holes in the universe. So in the top right is an image of what it would look like if we were near one of the most massive black holes in the universe. Uh, it would be incredible high density. And so this is an artist of uh, condition. It would be extremely high density of stars. And you would see that hole in the middle. Now I'm going to talk a bit a bit more about that. On the top left is one of my favorite images. So this is what you would see in the universe if you had a black hole that was about a 10 times the mass of the sun at about the distance of the moon. You would see these fantastic distortions. And those are, are due to what we know about how Einstein explained how space-time reacts to high density. These, uh, so all that light would be bent, and it would be a fantastic image. It would be, again, you know, it's about a black hole. It's about 10 times the mass of the sun at the distance of the moon. And it would be fantastic for about 10 seconds. And then we would all die. But I can, I can, I can assure you, I would love to see that. That would, uh, I, that, that, that would be the most pleasant way to go if we had to go in some way. That would be so just to be engulfed by a black hole. Okay, what I want to talk about is, is, is the role that black hole plays in the universe. And I can't stress enough, and I'm sure you've heard about this gravitational wave discovery about a year ago now. Um, it, and I'm sure uh, 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 a few people have, have, have talked about that here. That is one of the most important scientific discoveries in the history of science. And I, I, I place that in the top five. Most people place it in the top ten. It is unbelievable in terms of that, that we are alive now to witness what goes on around the black hole and the fact that we are able to interact with space and time. That is unbelievable to me. We have a, it, a new way to view the universe. And finding the emerging of these two black holes, and there's many more out there, the expectation, by the way, is that we should, uh, with uh, our gravitational wave detector, we should find about one of these merging black holes a day, which is unbelievable. And we, what we're doing is we're interacting with space itself. We've never been able to do that before, and it's unbelievable. And so what I want to talk about is, is, is the role that these black holes play and the importance that that's going to have a long term. Okay. Um, so what we're trying to do as astronomy is we're trying to understand where we start from and where we're going. On the top is an image. It's a baby picture of the universe. It's a picture that you would see of the universe in microwave photons. So this is a picture of the universe as it was just after the Big Bang, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The bottom image is an image of the, of the universe that we would see if you had no stars, so all those beautiful um, uh, Betelgeuse and all the beautiful stars that Serafina I'll talk about, they're just in my way. 
I want to look at the galaxies here and the black holes, and I want to understand how the universe evolves over time. And so what we're trying to do as astronomers is you take an imprint of how the universe started, and we want to make a model for how that evolves over time to get the distribution of galaxies that we see now. And so we want to know how you go from the top image to the bottom image. The top image is about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and the bottom image, image is close to 14 billion years after the Big Bang. That's the idea here. We know what's in the universe, uh, and, the, and, and how we do this in, in a very simplistic idea is we compare model to observations. On the right is reality. Those are the observations. On the right, if you look at the background with the red and the, white, with the, red and the black, that is how the galaxies are distributed in the universe. And you can zoom in, and there's this Humbrero, one of my favorite galaxies. I have a black hole measurement in this Humbrero. If you, and if you zoom in into the very central region there, that's an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. That is the, uh, a black hole in the very central point there of what's going on in the middle of this Humbrero. On the right is a computer simulation. And I'm sorry, on the left is a computer simulation. And what we try to do is we try to match the computer simulation to the model of the, to the observations of the universe. And we, we have to put a various components in there. So we have to include the black hole in the center of the galaxy. We have to include a dark matter and we have to include a dark energy. These are my favorite things. I have to make a Christmas carol about that. Dark, I, don't, I, I forget how the song goes now. I'm not gonna try to sing. But uh, we have a dark energy, dark matter, and black holes. This, this, this is what I work on. I work on each of those. Uh, we have a huge project on dark energy called HETDEX, the Hobby Ability Telescope, a dark energy ex experiment. A dark matter, this is the stuff this is, this is a crazy exciting time for dark matter. Dark matter has been, so, so the idea is that there is a particle out there that is the dominant component of mass in the universe, okay? It makes up 90% of the mass. We, though the stuff that we are made of, is a fairly significant, um, insignificant component. And dark matter is the dominant component. Um, I've been saying for 10 years now, that we are about one year away from finding that dark matter particle. <laughs> so we are about two years from finding that dark matter particle right now. Uh, and, and, and some of the results are really interesting. Now we've been failing in the lab to discover the dark matter particle and it's causing the theorists to reevaluate. And there are some interesting ideas now that are coming to light, both experimentally and observationally. There's this new idea called, ax there's an idea called axions that's been around for a very long time, but it's getting much more steam now in terms of what the dark matter is. So we don't know what that is, okay? We don't know what the dark matter is, but we know it's a dominant component of the galaxy. We see that observationally. And then we have black holes in the middle of galaxies. Each of these, a dark energy, a dark matter, and uh, black holes, these are objects that you can't see. And how you find them, each of them, is you look at how, how bodies are interacting with each of those, and the response is due to gravity. Okay, so what we use is our ideas of gravity. We try to understand how stars go around in the middle of a galaxy. We try to understand how stars go around the edge of a galaxy and we get what the dark matter is. And then we try to understand how galaxies interact with itself. And then from that, what we get is what is the, the uh, dark energy. And so, that, the, so this is why I wanted to connect it to uh, gravitational waves, is that all of these are based on our models of gravity. If we get gravity wrong, then we get each of those wrong. And there are some ideas out there that we can explain a, a dark energy and dark matter as modifications of gravity. And so that's what we are working on now, is we are trying to understand how gravity works. It is unbelievable to me that we don't understand how gravity works. We know that things fall, we understand that, and we can trace, and, and, and we can trace exactly how they fall, but I can't tell you why they fall. And that is unbelievable. I can't tell you the physics behind how gravity works. So that's what we're doing. Um, you've probably seen this pie chart before. I just want to go this very briefly. This is what is in the universe, okay? There is a dark energy. About 74% of the energy in the universe is in this component called 
dark energy. About 21% is in a dark matter. And the rest of the stuff that we are made of is about 5%. That's normal matter. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. That is 95% of the energy in the universe is in unknown material. That is fantastic job security for astronomers at this point. <laughs> We, 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 it is, and it is, it is, it is an embarrassment that I'm going to stand and tell you how we think a galaxy is formed. We're going to tell you how things evolve. We're going to tell you how beta juice uh, is evolving. We're going to tell you this stuff over and over again, and we don't understand 95% of the energy component of the universe. That's unbelievable. Now, I want you to not uh, take away that we are completely ignorant. Okay, that's not the point here. This is what science is about, and this is the exciting opportunity. Not understanding 95% of what's going on in the universe is, it's unbelievable. It's, 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 it's extremely imp impressive how much we've been able to do with that amount of ignorance. Okay, and, and I, I guess that's funny. <laughs> and, and so that, that's why we, we here at Texas are really pushing the boundaries in each of these, in dark matter and dark energy, to try to understand what's going on. Okay, so let me talk a bit about black holes. Um, we've, we've, we, we've never, we don't really know what goes on inside of a black hole, but I want to talk about the role of, of that they played. There's been a debate forever as to can you get the information out of a black hole if stuff falls into a black hole? Can you get that information out? We in physics do not like to lose information. Okay, that is, that, 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 that is a fundamental no-no when we go through our equations and when things fall into a black hole, that's a problem. Because the idea is that a black hole is a space where you curve space-time so much that it is curved in on itself. If this room were inside of a black hole and I took a laser pointer and shined that, a laser pointer th that way, it would come around and hit me in the back of the head. Space time is curved in on itself and that's what goes on in the, inside of a black hole. And that means, according to that, that information can't get out from the inside of the black hole, okay? Now, there's been a debate for a long time as to how that works, and we don't understand the theory. And so, this is where science comes in, and there is huge amounts of work to try to understand what is going on inside of a black hole. This is basically where string theory is trying to do a lot of work to try to understand all that details. And let me give a couple of ideas here. Um, and so, the basic answer is we don't know. Okay, it's okay for us. I mean, I really love to highlight our ignorance, and this is another one where we, where, where we don't know. It could be the idea that Einstein came up with and Schwarzschild solved, that is, there's a central singularity. If you take Einstein's equations for how mass and gravity interact with themselves, that all the mass just converts down to a point of radius equals to zero, of a size equal to zero. This is the idea of gravity wins. That is, and, and the problem here, and even Einstein had realized this, that if you take an object and you squeeze it down to a size of zero, what does that mean? You have an object with no size anymore. That's not an object. And so, and so that's a problem. We don't know how to solve that. It's a central singularity issue. Another issue is that it could be a nothing but a shell. This is where a quantum mechanics wins. So this is the idea that Stephen Hawking uh, came up with. And there's this called a quantum firewall around the edge of the black hole. And you never reach through. You just have a sphere. And in this sphere is this quantum state where all the material is deposited in that sphere. And that hole is a hole. There's nothing that you can access to our universe. And then the other one is a new state of matter on the inside, and this is where Hollywood goes nuts. You fly in, you fly to other, um, other universes, you go and visit, you know, your grandmother you know, from, you know, a long time ago as a, as a child, on and on and on. That's, 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 that's another, well, that's not a possibility, but, but that's, that's, that's one idea that Hollywood has about that. Okay, but fundamentally is, is a, we don't know what goes on inside of a black hole. Now, for me... What I mainly do is observations. 
I try to measure the masses of black holes. I relate those masses to galaxies, and then I try to understand how the black hole mass and the galaxy mass came to be that way. And then I just make a model for how the galaxy grows and how the black hole grows. So where I end is the, is the event horizon of the black hole. I'm not trying to predict what goes on inside of a black hole. I'm trying to predict the mass of the black hole. And one thing I've been working a lot on is trying to understand how often black holes will merge. And what this will do is related to these gravitational wave events. So that's one thing I try to do. Um, one model I've been working on, and this is where we have been taking data from the Hobby, Hobby Everly Telescope for a long time now. This is the galaxy, NGC 1277. It's a normal looking a galaxy. It's the one up, up on the top there. And this has one of the most massive black holes in the known universe. Not the most massive, but one of the most massive. What's special about this a galaxy is that it is a relatively small galaxy. It's actually smaller, it's a little bit smaller than our Milky Way galaxy. And it has black hole that's about a hundred times more massive than what you would expect. What I'm trying to do now is I have a large program where we're trying to measure the most massive black holes in the universe. And it's not just because I like big things. This is because when you measure the most massive things, when you measure the extreme things, the most massive or the least massive, that's when you have the biggest constraints on the theory that underlies how they actually happen to be. So that's what we're trying to do is measure these extreme things and then understand where they came from. This black hole is a remarkable black hole in, in simply because it kind of kills all the theories. Back in 2000, I put out a, um, an observational study that showed uh, effectively every galaxy contained a black hole and the mass of that black hole was related to the mass of the galaxy. Since then, there have been of order 20 theoretical models that try to explain that relationship. And this galaxy that I found a few years ago uh, kills all those 20 models. And so we're kind of going back to the drawing board to understand how these black holes can grow to such a, a large size. So this black hole in this galaxy, so this is just, just to put the event horizon alone on scale, it's larger than our solar system. So this black hole would swallow us whole if it came towards us, which is kind of cool as well. You wouldn't get the great distortions that I showed in the first image, but it would still be kind of cool. You would be inside of a black hole hole and we would just kind of fly through and not really notice until we got to the central singularity in the middle of the galaxy, in the middle of the black hole. So as I always say, uh, is that even black holes are bigger in Texas. We have, uh, we, we've been using the Hobby Ability Telescope for quite some time now to try to find these most massive black holes. And what is nice is now, now uh, Texas is actually known for finding, I think the top five black holes have been found in Texas at this point. <laughs> I guess, we, I guess we should take some pride in that one. Okay, um, so what I want to end with though is that what we have on the left here is the Hobby Eberly Telescope. Okay, uh, we are working on, on so this is, this is one of the premier telescopes in the world. Okay, and, and the data coming off of that is really exciting. We're doing a huge upgrade now. It's gonna be fantastic for black hole studies. The a diagram on the right is the Giant Magellan Telescope. That's the one that we are building. It's about a $100 billion telescope. Right now, a Texas has, has put in about, uh, about close to $52 million. We need another $48 million because we're trying to get up to a, a $100 million. So we're, gonna, we're going to pass a hat around uh, 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 later on. Um, and that telescope is going to find the most blast of so the most massive black holes anywhere in the universe. At the edge of the observable universe, it'll find the most massive black holes and we'll be able to model these things as a function of time. I have this line at the bottom, astronomy is out of this world. One of the issues that I get, you know, that my friends talk to me about all the time, my, uh, so my friends who are, who are in economics 
and medicine, and they're doing stuff that really matters. And they say, why are you wasting your time with this astronomy and astrophysics stuff? And it's always a hard question, right? There's always benefits from science. We know that. Um, and you, we can talk about the practical benefits. We can talk about, you know, just pushing the boundaries. But what I love is given the state of what we're going through in our country and in the world, it's nice to have something that takes us and places us outside of the reality that we see every day. We get a little more appreciation for what we have. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Right here. So we asked why there is expected relationship between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy, basically because there's more stuff in bigger galaxies. So if you have a, and so, but so, 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 so I'll expand on that a bit. If you have a really big galaxy, you have a lot of stuff that can collide. Two things hit in a galaxy, they lose their velocity, they fall in towards the middle. If there's a black hole sitting there, that will feed the black hole and make the, hole, and make the black hole get bigger. If you have a bigger galaxy, you have more stuff to collide and fall in and make that black hole get larger. So it's not a surprise that there are bigger black holes and bigger galaxies. What is a surprise in that what I didn't show you is that the relationship is unbelievably tight. That is, if you tell me the mass of the black hole, I can tell you the mass of the galaxy and vice versa. And that is where the theory comes in. And that's where that galaxy, NGC 1277, is really throwing everything off. We had this beautiful model for how a black hole and the galaxy mass can be related. It has to do with um, how much material you can feed into the black hole at once. And now that thing threw it off. And so, the answer in the end is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the longest way to say I have no idea. Another question. Right here. Um, the size of the, of the largest black hole, or the largest hole, is that just from the formula for gravity that you know that given that mass, that the formula for gravity, that, that the power of right. preventing life from escaping right. this far out. Right. So, so he's asking a good a question about how do we know the size of the black hole? And let me, uh, let, let me just expose our ignorance again. That is, um, we don't know that black holes exist. Okay, I've been using the word black hole, and we don't know that that we've never measured an event horizon. We've never measured this point of no return. We've never done what Hollywood has done and, and flown Matthew McConaughey onto the edge of a black hole. We can't do that right now. And so all we have to rely on is comparing the theory to observations. And so there are some observations coming up within the next few months to about a year that will measure the event horizon of a black hole. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. And so that's the point where we're really going to test the theory as to how we measure that size. Right now, it's just a really good theory. I mean, Einstein's a pretty smart guy. So he came up with this really good uh, theory. And so that's how we're doing this right now. It's just theoretical. Another question up top. Yes. Okay, right. So what that was called, so that, that name is called an ATOF projection. The problem is, so she's asking how you project that, um, that oval image uh, from the sky. And all that is is a simple tool. So what you do is you take that oval and you wrap it around your head, and that's the full sky. And so just imagine trying a way to imagine the uh, 360 degree we're inside the sphere. And so what you do is you wrap that sphere around and you project it on a two-dimensional structure. So all that is is a pictorial way to take a three-dimensional structure that we're in and make it a two-dimensional image that I, can, that I can put on the screen. That's all that is. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's baby universe um, as we see it. Right. Oh, there's one more question. So 
So he's asking about quantum entanglement and getting um, information out of a black hole. And I really hope you apply to the University of Texas. <laughs> uh, so, so let me know <laughs> when you do. Um, okay, so, so this is really interesting. So a quantum entanglement is this idea that if you make two particles um, out of, so, oh man, I gotta get into quantum physics here. Okay, okay, um, so there, there are particles that, that, that can be um, intertwined uh, quantum mechanically. And all that means is that you, when you make particles, you can make particles with, you know, that will, will able to conserve a charge, like positive and negative, or conserve spin, like spin up and spin down. And when you make these particles, they come in a pair because they have to conserve this. There are certain conservation quantities. If you toss one particle into the black hole and you have another particle outside of the black hole, then somehow if you can measure the quantum state of the particle that's outside of the black hole, you will know the quantum state of the particle inside of the black hole. So in a sense, that is getting information from inside the black hole. In other or the way to think about it, if the particle that fell into the black hole I mean, interacts in a certain way and then you know its spin or its charge, then you know the information on the outside. And so quantum entanglement, you are exactly right. Maybe one way to get information out of the black hole. And this is the argument that Hawking have used where I, I, I actually had an explanation on there where quantum mechanic wins, where you can actually use this idea of quantum entanglement to get information out? That's an excellent question. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.